Aloha. I have to say that with this shirt. You know, I'm really glad that I don't have to make the decisions uh, about the extinction, that I can be um, uh, on the periphery of this, because uh, I'm very polarized in my own mind about this. Uh, first on the perhaps slightly negative side, as a conservation biologist working in Hawaii, I've, I've heard of this issue of uh, invasive species before. In fact, we spend much of our time dealing with them. On the other hand, um, a little truth-telling, as a paleoecologist, I spent much of uh, my professional life studying extinct species and what caused their extinction and what their lives were like and what their environments were like. So I'm irresistibly drawn to this. I can't stay away from this. If this is going to happen, and I suspect it, it will in some sense, whether I want it to or not, uh, I want to be nearby. I don't want to miss this. This is going to be interesting. This will not be boring. And, of course, the little boy in me uh, is very much attracted to this idea as well. You know, we've heard a lot today from time to time about the, the moral aspect of this. I want to give you a little background on that because, uh, in a sense, uh, the kind of work that I do has provided some of the justification for, for that view. Uh, so I, I want to trace for you the last 50,000 years of history in, in a minute or two. Uh, I think uh, you, could, you could start out by saying, if you look at how Homo sapiens has moved across the planet, you could say that uh, humans are a, uh, an endemic species in Africa and perhaps uh, uh, parts of uh, uh, southern Eurasia, an invasive species everywhere else. We are a biological invasion of the first order. So we started out of Africa, and uh, in the late Pleistocene, we moved into uh, the uh, northern parts of Eurasia. Uh, we moved over into Australia and Japan. A little bit later on, we made our way across to the Americas at the end of the Pleistocene. Uh, from there, we began to cross water gaps, hitting the big, easy targets first, like the uh, Antilles and uh, uh, places uh, uh, like the Mediterranean islands, and, and late uh, in the Holocene, a couple thousand years ago, getting to Madagascar. Uh, from there, uh, the, the last prehistorically colonized places were colonized by the Polynesians in the last thousand years, finally reaching really remote places uh, like Hawaii. But you know, there's one other group that we tend to overlook. This very interesting uh, a, a group of uh, places, fairly rare category. These are places that were never colonized prehistorically. And in fact, what happened there was all written down. Places like the Mascarene uh, Archipelago, the Galapagos Islands, uh, and of course, Antarctica. And uh, what was written down, of course, is, I think, uh, something of a Rosetta Stone for understanding what happened in other places. Because we hear about the path of destruction that follows human arrival. So uh, Tim Flannery and I, in an article uh, <clears throat> several years ago, back in 2005, uh, reviewed this, uh, the literature on this human colonization and its impacts worldwide. And uh, we made a little statement, which we challenged other scientists to uh, disprove. We said a global pattern of human arrival to previously uninhabited land masses followed by faunal cl collapse and other ecological changes appears without known exception. So we've been waiting almost 10 years for somebody to tell us a case where this did not happen when people arrive. So that's the moral issue we're talking about in, in perhaps a little more detail. Now, where does that lead? Well, it leads in several places, uh, sometimes rather strange places. The next three panels are actually from an article that Josh Dunlin wrote about this idea of Pleistocene rewilding for Scientific American. Uh, starting with, uh, if you take a sort of a typical scene in Western North America, um, uh, 12,000, 14,000 years ago, it would look something like this, a lot like the uh, Serengeti in a way, with uh, an incredible diversity. Today, the same scene, um, maybe not quite so interesting. Still large herbivores, but not so many different kinds. But this next panel is the one that scares the crap out of people because one of the suggestions is that perhaps we could, uh, in a securely fenced large area uh, in the western United States or some such place, bring back uh, the closest living relatives of some of these creatures are ecological surrogates, e ecological substitutes. Fascinating idea. People are already doing this in many places in the world, as, as you've heard a bit already about Europe. 
But um, at the time that uh, a group of us were meeting at uh, one of uh, Ted Turner's ranches uh, out in the West, uh, Ladder Ranch and near Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. I love the name of that place. Uh, uh, there were a dozen of us that met um, about a decade ago to talk about these ideas and about, you know, does this idea of rewilding and ecological surrogacy, do these things have some, some value in conservation? It was a little bit like this meeting in a way, or, or the meeting that preceded this, where we talked about these more in private. And uh, I was sort of the contrarian at that meeting. I was the person that said, I think these are good ideas, but I think if we hit people too hard with this, talking about lions and elephants and stuff, we're just going to scare them away and discredit the idea. I sort of turned out to be right about that in some ways. Uh, but at the same time, I was promoting this idea and actually doing this already in a much milder form out on the island of Kauai, where my wife and I have a lease on some uh, old worn out farmland and uh, some uh, areas of mine spoil and uh, abandoned quarry that nobody really wanted that happened to have in the center of it the richest fossil site in the entire Hawaiian islands. And so we, we took that information and we began then to bring back things that were there before that weren't extinct. So we do two kinds of things there. We have been doing this now for over a decade. Um, we go down deep, dark, creepy pits and we bring up wonderful fossils and study that. That's the past part. The other part of what we do is more, you might say, the future part. We use that in sort of uh, innovative ways to actually look at... Um, uh, bringing back things that maybe are extinct on that island, but they're, they're still uh, uh, existing somewhere else, um, or uh, working with very endangered species to bring their numbers up and get a, as much genetic rescue into the process as possible. And that's what you see my wife, Lida Piggott Burney, who's the manager of the Makawai Cave Reserve, uh, doing the picture on the right. Well, we realize that it's never going to really look like we imagined in uh, this uh, a two-page spread in the uh, center of a book that I wrote about that site uh, a few years ago, uh, because about half the things in this picture are extinct. However, I'm proud to say that most of the rest of the things are now back on this site, which was basically abandoned farmland when we started. So this is a little bit of a poor man's Jurassic Park scheme in that way. Um, However, it's not a perfect world. In fact, one of the things we soon realize is when you clear out all these invasive species, you start planting the native plants, you get on a thing we call the weed treadmill. Uh, we spend so much of our time and energy after that just basically trying to keep the invasives from coming back into it with all sorts of equipment and, you know, with a, a carbon footprint from mowers and all this sort of thing and gobbling up all of our volunteer hours, pulling weeds and so forth and so on. We felt a little desperate, even to the point of resorting to bulldozers in some cases. But we did what we've done um, uh, time after time in this project, which is to go back to the fossil record for advice. And by that I mean, we looked at it and we said, what is missing here? Now we know there's all these weeds on the ground here, they're crowding our native trees and shrubs, uh, but if we try to use herbivores with teeth, you know, the, all these introduced goats and pigs and sheep and so forth, uh, they just eat up our native plants first. They like them better than the weeds. But if, if fortunately, uh, back in the 90s, um, I did some work with Helen James of the uh, Smithsonian uh, on the uh, fossil turds of excuse, coprolites, the coprolites of uh, the, this bird you see on the left or, or, or some of its cousins. It turns out that, you know, Hawaii had giant flightless ducks and geese, giant in, by waterfowl standards. I like to say they're the kind of waterfowl you wouldn't want to meet in a dark alley. These were quite large birds, quite heavily built, uh, didn't need to fly. They were bigger than anybody else. And we found from studying the coprolites that their diet was probably most similar to that of giant tortoises. Giant tortoises were probably the, the animals still living that were closest uh, in so many ways ecologically to these birds. And so we got started on this. Now this part's a long story. It's a different talk. But the gist of it is we didn't spawn this idea in a vacuum because thanks to National Geographic, uh, I had been uh, working for a number of years in the southwest Indian Ocean region and on islands like Mauritius and uh, Rodrigues, which is a little island east of there. And what we saw there was that uh, even though tortoises had been extinct there for over 100 years, they had been brought back from uninhabited Aldabra Island, the only place where uh, a, species, a different species of tortoises had persisted in that region, and they do the weeding for them. They do a marvelous job of that. You basically plant your native plants, you fence the area in, you put in the giant tortoises, and you walk away. It's just about that good. So we decided we need to look into this, because even though tortoises never made it to Hawaii, these two-legged 
feathered tortoises, so to speak, had done uh, a similar kind of work. They had basically kept the understory clear, we believe, because they would have been very numerous. There were no predators big enough to take these as adults. So we started looking around. We realized there are tortoises uh, out there uh, that can be used already in Hawaii. We didn't have to import any tortoises because people buy uh, the African spurred tortoises and the leopard tortoises as a cute little pet. And the next thing you know, uh, you have this 100-pound behemoth in your backyard. And so we were able to adopt a lot of tortoises. So a year and many tortoises later, as you can see, the fence, uh, inside the fence and outside, quite a difference. The tortoises are not only uh, eating our weeds and mowing the, the grass, but they're also uh, fertilizing the ground, and they're providing a great uh, experiment, experimental uh, subject uh, for uh, our colleagues, like uh, Jim Juvik here from University of Hawaii and our uh, various uh, interns. So how, how can you not love that face? This was an example of uh, uh, really kind of going out on a limb in terms of an ecological surrogacy using a completely different animal. And why is this relevant? It's relevant because what it shows us really relates to de-extinction in one particular way, I think. And that is, um, a lot of people said, this may be kind of a distraction from the serious work you're doing with uh, several dozen uh, uh, extremely rare native plants and making wildlife habitat for the, uh, the, for the rare birds and so on and so on. It's had exactly the opposite effect. We now have uh, more than twice the visitation we had before. I think we'll have 20,000 visitors this year. It's more than doubled our donations. Uh, we have a lot more volunteers. People love these animals. They show up for this. And uh, it, it tells me that uh, what we're doing here uh, is uh, both with the extinction and also with these other kinds of sort of outside the box projects is we're trafficking in a very rare and valuable commodity in conservation, as you've heard before. And that's hope. Thank you very much. Thank you.